ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And the mission of the project is to expand the capacity to provide best practice care for common and complex diseases to underserved populations and to measure the outcomes of that effort. We are actually funded by uh, the Department of Health, Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The story of ECHO starts with uh, a disease called hepatitis C. It affects 170 million people worldwide, of which 4 million have been infected in the United States. Of these 4 million patients, 3 million have viral infection currently. The Center of Disease Control in Atlanta has just come out with statistics saying that of these 3 million people without treatment, 1 million would die during the course of their lifetime. Worldwide, more than 50 million deaths would occur from hepatitis C, with very little hope of getting treatment to most of these patients. In New Mexico, where I live, there were 28,000 patients with this disease. And in 2004, when we started Project ECHO, less than 5% had been treated. And we anticipated many thousands would die. There were also 2,300 prisoners, none of whom had been treated. We had twice the rates of liver disease deaths in uh, New Mexico compared to the national average. But the good news there in 2004 was this disease is curable. It gets cured about half to 80% of the time, depending on what kind of virus you have. The problem was that there were very serious side effects. The treatment involves injections every week, uh, pills, a sort of a chemotherapy-like regimen. And lots of side effects, as mentioned on these slides. And not a single primary care doctor was treating hepatitis C in New Mexico in 2004. Less than 5% of those people had been treated, uh, of the 28,000 patients. And they were trying to come to see me in my clinic. Um, I used to run a hepatitis C clinic, I still do, in Albuquerque. And there was an eight-month wait to see me. If somebody had genotype 1 virus infection, which is two-thirds of all patients, they would have to make 18 trips to see me, sometimes 200, 250 miles each way, to get one course of treatment for a cure. And as I mentioned, cure is life-saving because it prevents cirrhosis, liver cancer, etc. Because New Mexico is very underserved for healthcare services. 32 of 33 counties are medically underserved. 14 are health professional shortage areas and only 20% of doctors there practice in rural or frontier areas. And a lot of the people who live in these areas are very poor. They don't have the, the resources to travel 250 miles 18 times, take time off work, et cetera. So we developed a new model of care called, which we call the ECHO model, with the goal of the model was to develop the capacity to treat hepatitis C in all areas in New Mexico and to monitor outcomes. And secondly, we thought if we could treat hepatitis C in New Mexico, we'd have a model that could be used um, for other complex diseases in rural locations, developing countries. It could be used in India for treating HIV, where out of uh, 3 million patients with HIV, only 500,000 or less are receiving treatment. We developed a partnership between the university, the prison system, the health department, Indian Health Service, and community primary care clinicians who are willing to partner with us to say, yes, we recognize this is a problem. Our patients don't have access to treatment, and we are willing to help you treat this in our, lo in our local areas. Project ECHO is based on four key ideas. If you had to remember one slide, this is the one to remember. We use technology, multi-point video conferencing, and the internet to leverage scarce healthcare resources that may only exist in a city, or a Mayo Clinic, or a university. Second, we use a disease management model. Uh, disease management is based on the work of Deming, who essentially said if you want to enhance quality, you want to reduce variation in process and standardize across best practice, across everywhere where you are manufacturing, in this case, everywhere where you're treating. So in ECHO, we said we would make 20 centers of excellence all across New Mexico for treating hepatitis C. These were manned by primary care clinicians and their teams, and we would standardize across best practices. And best practice in ECHO has four primary components to it. It has the algorithm. That is, if you have this kind of virus, that's what you want to treat for this long. Second, it has what Atul Gawande uh, described in New York, or checklists. Third, 
It has a process. We know that to treat somebody very complex, it's a complex regimen, and you need to be able to say who does what, what is the role of the medical assistant, the nurse, the doctor. But, but fourthly, what makes best practice in medicine different from anything else in manufacturing is that each patient is different. It's not the same Toyota coming down the uh, assembly line. And there's a 300-pound patient who's homeless versus 200 pounds rich in a city, rural area, social support, no social support. And therefore, an expert clinician has to exercise wisdom to implement best practice. And that's the fourth component that we thought we needed to bring into ECHO to make it effective. Third, key principle in Project ECHO is case-based learning. We said if you're going to train these primary care clinicians when they went to medical school and residency, how did they learn? They learned with mentors, co-managing patients with their professors. And we said we could use the same mechanism of case-based learning by co-managing patients with them and bringing, have them learn by doing, just like a pilot learns when he's trying to fly a plane. He couldn't read a manual and actually fly a plane. And lastly, we said we'll use the internet to track outcomes. We train these physicians, nurses, in hepatitis C. We train them to use our web-based software for outcomes, eye health. And we conduct these telemedicine clinics, which we call knowledge networks. This is what a knowledge network looks like. Every Wednesday afternoon, 15 or so doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, et cetera, join in an interactive video conference. And that big square on the left is the University of New Mexico. I cannot treat hepatitis C alone. I need a psychiatrist. I need a pharmacist with me. And one by one, these clinicians, first Espanola, then Pecos Valley, Las Vegas, these are all small towns in New Mexico. They present patients with hepatitis C along a standardized presentation format of about three to four minutes. And over the course of a couple of hours, we will co-manage 10 to 15 patients with hepatitis C. Also, we'll give them a brief didactic presentation, about 10 or 15 minutes on some aspect of hepatitis C during the course of this clinic. We call that a knowledge network. No patient ever comes to it. This is just healthcare clinicians. And the way they learn is called a learning loop in which one clinician, a nurse practitioner in a rural area, learns from us, our expertise. They learn through our didactic presentations. They learn from each other. But mostly, they learn by doing, which is the most powerful way to learn. We give them no-cost continuing medical education credits for participating, and we want to reduce professional isolation by bringing, um, by bringing a mix of work and learning into the rural environment. Normally, in a rural area, it's all work with little opportunity to learn. We've done 500 such clinics. More than 5,000 people have entered the disease management program. More than 15,000 hours of continuing medical education credit we know that for a clinician to do something really complicated for which he wasn't trained in residency, he needs to have self-efficacy. Here is, we are studying self-efficacy of these providers before and 12 months after participation. And you can see ability to identify candidates for treatment, 2.8 to 5.6. The scale here is one, I have no skill. Seven, I'm an expert who can teach others. Question three, ability to treat and manage side effects goes from two out of seven to 5.2. Can you now serve as a local consultant within your area and in your clinic, 2.4 to 5.6? Overall competence, 2.8 to 5.5. We also know that a clinician needs to find it beneficial. It's not enough to be confident to do something to do it. Here, 97, 94, 98 percent of them feel that this kind of knowledge and competence is a moderate or major benefit to them. And then they, they report dramatic improvements in professional, um, reductions in professional isolation, improvements in professional satisfaction, and they endorse that an echo-like model expands access to treatment in their communities. Finally, of course, you need to show this is a very complex disease. People can die from the treatment. You need to show that it's as safe and effective. So we did a hepatitis C trial to train primary care clinicians to deliver hepatitis C care in rural areas, and to show that it's as safe and effective and we can improve care for minorities, because minorities have a very hard time accessing care for this disease. There were 16 community-based clinics, five prisons. This was the intervention arm, and the control was the University of New Mexico liver clinic. This was a prospective cohort study design. 
I just, for the people who don't like randomized control trials, let me just tell you this wasn't one. We couldn't do a randomized control trial because it'd be difficult to randomize a patient who was in the community uh, to the university, lived five hours away. It would um, be even harder to uh, randomize a university patient to the prison. And for these reasons, um, we had to do a prospective cohort study. And the principal endpoint was a sustained viral response, um, no detectable virus six months after completion of treatment. This is what we call a cure for hepatitis C, and it prevents all complications of the future. The minority were 68% in the echo arm versus 49% in the university. So we met an important goal of ours. And the cure rate was 50 and 46%, 70 and 71 for other genotypes. Essentially, we concluded that rural primary care clinicians deliver hepatitis C care that is as safe and effective as in a university clinic in this echo model, and that we can improve care for minorities. An interesting finding we found was that the cure rates were actually higher than any other community reported trial in the United States so far. And we think this may be because of getting care locally, better adherence, better relationship with primary care clinicians, team-based care, and the ability to bring a multidisciplinary input into the care of a single patient uh, while the learning of these primary care clinicians is going on. After hepatitis C was successful, uh, we uh, were requested to start other echoes, and we described six criteria. If the disease was common, management was complex, new treatments were coming, high societal impact, if there were serious outcomes of untreated disease, and if you had effective treatments, you could use this model. Here, I'm trying to focus on a principle called the Pareto's principle. It's the 80-20 rule, essentially saying that you don't need to start echoes for 200 diseases. There are a few diseases that count for the vast majority of morbidity and mortality. That's the 80-20 rule. And if we could do echoes for just those important diseases and provide the same level of care at a community health center as you do at a university, you'd have a tremendous expansion in the number of people getting best practice. The principal goal of Project ECHO is what we call a force multiplier. A force multiplier is something, a term I'm using in healthcare to define a concept I'd like to convey, which is a logarithmic improvement in capacity of care. That is, we want a 10 times expansion. We need that kind of expansion to manage HIV in Africa or tuberculosis in India, et cetera, and hepatitis C in the United States. If you can have a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, provide the same level of care that normally a Nick LaRusso will provide for liver disease, then you get a tremendous expansion in capacity of care, and that's a force multiplier. We now have echoes for many, many problems. We have HIV, geriatrics, hepatitis C, cardiac risk reduction, asthma, rheumatology. All through the week, we have some echo project going on at more than 300 sites all across New Mexico um, where in each area, a group of clinicians get together and say, I'm going to become an expert in hepatitis C, one in, in um, diabetes, another in asthma. And they support each other so people don't have to travel 250 miles. To give you an example of a force multiplier, these are sites we've set up all over New Mexico for treatment of addiction, integrated addiction and psychiatry. And this is, the red is there are only 15 doctors in, per million population in um, the United States in rural low-income Hispanic zip codes, 15 doctors per million population who can treat opiate addiction with a new drug called buprenorphine. New Mexico is that blue line after echo starts, which is that green vertical line. And you can see we have six times the capacity to do that in New Mexico now than any other state um, where this kind of population lives. The other point about echo we realized three years into it is that chronic disease management is a team sport. Just training nurse practitioners and physician assistants and doctors is not enough. They need trained teams. So we started initiatives to train community health workers and medical assistants to become specialists in certain disease areas, such as diabetes or substance use disorders, to actually assist these doctors to provide best practice care. We got encouragement from this paper in circulation, which showed that if a doctor had a trained expert assistant, community health worker, he could do twice as good for blood pressure control, LDL, and smoking cessation. So we have three training tr programs uh, for diabetes, substance use disorders, and, and we also train prisoners to train other prisoners on HIV, sexually transmitted diseases, et cetera. 
We give these high school graduates three days of on-site training, give them these webcams, they go home and join weekly video-based clinics where they get trained on these areas. We don't make them physicians. We train them on diet, exercise, smoking cessation, gentle nudges, finger sticks, etc., which have been shown to be highly effective. They are very inexpensive, and these community health workers get paid only $10 an hour, but they do enormous work. These are prisoners. We have trained 100 diabetes community health workers outside. In the prison, we have trained 160 community health workers, which we call peer educators. And they become experts in how not to transmit hepatitis C, HIV, sexually transmitted diseases, et cetera. And each prisoner in New Mexico is getting a 10-hour curriculum on these four diseases. Um, also, <clears throat> what we find is these trainers get enormous skills over time. The potential benefits to the health system here for an eco-like model could be improved quality and safety, rapid learning, improving access for rural and underserved patients, workforce training and force multiplier effects, improving professional satisfaction, supporting the medical home model, uh, cost-effective care, um, preventing cost of untreated disease. We are now replicating it at the University of Washington, who've done it for hepatitis C, chronic pain and substance use disorders, University of Chicago. The Veterans Administration in the United States is, is replicating for four separate disease areas, and we've also replicated it in India. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, using video conferencing, best practice protocols, co-managing patients with case-based learning, the ECHO model. By the way, the ECHO model is a design change. I, I'm trying to fit this model into the current conference. <laughs> The ECHO model is a robust way to safely and effectively treat chronic common complex diseases in underserved areas and to monitor outcomes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much.